Boom. Welcome, welcome. Lafont Mantle. Mantle, do I call you two chains? Two chains. Two chains. Uh you can just call me Mantle Hook. Okay, okay. They were calling you two chains off camera, so I didn't know if you were creeping on my my nickname, my IRL, my IRL nickname. Um, no. Thanks for joining us today. All right, everyone, I'll kick us off real quick. Today is uh, Wednesday, July 31st. <clears throat> Marty's Option Talk we do every two weeks. Uh, these are pretty casual for those of you that have been joined us before. Today we have Loquant and Mantle. Uh, welcome, boys. Just give a little Hello. brief intro on yourselves, and then we'll uh, we'll get into just talking shit. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I've my my account is quite new, but I've been in Bitcoin, you know, probably uh, I don't know, probably like ten years now, eleven years maybe. So, watch the charts every day. Um, I've been in Bitcoin probably not definitely not as long as Manahu. probably. I bought the top in 2017, 2018. Yeah, I never looked back since. We need people like you, Little Quant. We always need top buyers and bottom sellers to keep our momentum going. Yeah. You guys just want to give a little bit of intro of what you guys do in the crypto space and why crypto Twitter, I guess. That's a good start. Go ahead, Quant. Um, on crypto Twitter, yeah, I guess pretty much. A do a little bit of option stuff, try to do some quant stuff. Like, I guess just graduated school for data science, like this February. So I guess like, it's not even a full year of me doing quant stuff. Um, that's pretty much it, I guess. Like before I traded like very different compared to how I trade now. Were you just degenning before versus like doing algorithmic stuff or were you doing like book trading? Kind of take us through that journey a little bit of how or why like quant stuff why algorithm trading over click trading why buying the top is not recommended um definitely don't buy the top um like when things get crazy like that like yeah looking back like when i bought it i was like i was so like i drank the cooling like the crypto cooling right like inflation like fuck the government it's all that stuff like like I was consumed by that, right? Like that really resonated with me. And so, yeah, I bought the top and then it was like, okay, sh I think Verge or whatever was the coin I bought. And like, I made so much money, however, like, like the shortest amount of time span, I'm like, wow, this is, this shit is the future, right? Like I, I quit my job, started to learn how to trade. Didn't know how to trade at all. Never traded before, never traded stocks. So pretty much was like losing money over and over and over and over. How many Try. ports did you blow? How many portfolios? Oh man, like, I don't even know, dude. I don't even know. It's like too many to count. Too many to count. It's just it's mostly like to do the high. Oh numbers. Jesus! It's, like, it's too many to count. Like, yeah. I, I Why was that so alluring back then and not now? Like, for, I feel like for a lot of us that got started at that time or before, there was this allure to like having unconfiscatable money and you know uh as cliche as it is you know peer-to-peer -peer cash and uh this like digital economy that we thought might be the future because it was you know a mix of computers and money uh and that doesn't seem to be the case anymore like people don't come to crypto uh for that like why do you think there's this big like, sentiment shift or or maybe not even sentiment shift but like ethos shift Mm. Well, I wonder if I could come in here. I, I mean, I think you've got to say, you know, what is the most useful use case for crypto? And for 99.9% .9 of people in the world, what they don't have time or the knowledge to understand the merits of why they should buy Bitcoin or Monero, whatever, they, whatever else out there. They just, they, all they know is dollars. They've known dollars their whole life. They want dollars. And that's why we see the biggest adoption in crypto is Tether, because it is the most successful crypto product. So there you go. Oh, in terms of like, well, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, like Tether is like 100 employees, they print money, and at the very beginning, they faked it till they made it, right? But Juan, I want to 
want to go back to you in terms of how did you go from like retail to now pro tail? How, how did you go from, okay, I'm going to start clicking buttons to, or click from clicking buttons, blowing portfolios, losing money into, okay, I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to algo trade. I'm going to build bots. I'm going to, you know, pick up this journey instead. I think that would be an interesting conversation for people to listen to on the retail side that are, I think at stage one now clicking buttons here to get rich quick, you know, shit coining, meme coins, whatever you want to call it. So I guess, why did you quit your job and how did you get into quant stuff? And, uh, yeah, we can start there. Um, why did I quit my job? Um, I was selling cars at the time and I made like, I think I, I made more buying Verge, uh, whatever, the yeah, coin I bought and it, I made more buying that. I was like, why am I working? Like I spent eight, 10, 12 hours here. I just did this in like, in the shortest amount of time span, right? Um, so that that would what really hooked me was like obviously the money. Um, but then as I started learning more, I guess, and like since just learning from then, like I think it wasn't until like last cycle of like FTX when I really heard of the word quant, and that's when I'm like, okay, these guys are doing this. They're doing they're able to do things way faster than I can ever. Let's say, for example, let's say I were to ask you to like um, quote on three different exchanges, three different coins. You're going to have three different browsers. You're going to click on each one, type how much on each coin, and then click the limit order or whatever, right? But these algo guys, they're like, boom, it's just it's just there. Like, okay, this, 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 boom, and the order is sent already, right? Like, you just can't compete with that speed. And I felt like, okay, so if there's that like i guess like a skill issue or skill like disparity i guess like okay then that alone i think is an edge compared to people that don't algo trade versus people that do so i think speed is one thing that you get with algo trading that you can't you can't do with manual clicking um i guess that's like one of the first things that made me realize okay i need to learn how to code and funny enough like Mano, Mano who was showing me some stuff on like his GitHub that he made. I was like, this is so fucking cool. This is so cool. <laughs> yeah. No, and even, even in terms of timing, like when the front end is down, the API usually isn't, right? So you can still get orders. You can still cancel orders. You can withdraw anything that you think that you could do with an exchange. You can do with uh, an API. And the API just is a. Uh, a programmatically way to pull data and information. You also can collect data, exchange data, you can trade with it, you can market make, you can pull orders, whatever you want to execute, you can. Um, instead of ever going to the front end, like we rarely go to a front end for anything at this point, right? Like we'll go to front ends to provide feedback and things like this, but in terms of like firing orders or getting positions or, you know, any sort of trading it's not skill but any sort of thing that you would use for trading um you can do all with the api and even we're competing in like the milliseconds right we're like oh well why are we getting beat out right let's say on an exchange well now we have to co-locate with the exchange we have to have a server racked in the same warehouse as the exchange instead of like you know my partner is about 10 kilometers from uh, one of the largest derivatives exchanges and he's still getting beaten out by like, I think it was like 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds. So now we have to pay for a server, right? So even on the, the algo side, you still can get beat out even though you're super, super close. And even though your code is lean and your bots are you know fast, um, but that's more on the market making side, right? That's not um, you know firing off individual directional positions, right? This is on the market making side options. So and hedging out with perps all at the same time. So what kind of bots are you guys building now? Both of you guys. Um, I'm trying to figure out what to build right now at this moment. Like, I think I have all the stuff that I think I need, like the exchanges. And it's just like trying to put like the bigger picture together and then of which part is going to, I guess, hedge which side or which side wants to do which, I think. So that's what I'm trying to figure out right now. And yeah. 
On the perp side or the option side, or both? I want to try both, but I think I'm going to try starting with perps and just, yeah, perps and spot, and then gradually go towards options, I think. I think they all they all go together, right? So if you're yeah. trading options and then you're hedging with perps or you're hedging with spot, or I guess even if you're just doing perps and spot, you're always rebalancing the portfolio to keep deltas at zero or capture the spread, right? You're, are you trying to do market making or are you trying to directionally do like momentum kind of box? Um, I, I personally like, I, I like, I like being Delta neutral. I like being Delta. Like I'm comfortable with it. Like, yeah, I just, why, why take the risk? Like why? But in Delta money? neutral in Bitcoin. <laughs> Definitely not yet, but like, yes, net long Bitcoin profits are in Bitcoin, but everything else is like pretty, pretty hedge, I think. Yeah, I mean, your job, I mean, as a maker, usually we're always delta neutral. We're here to provide liquidity. And the more, you know, we capture a little spread, the more people trade, the more money we make. So it doesn't matter what price is doing. Um, it just becomes more of an operational risk and hedging out. But in terms of like our bots, they should never trade unless they're making money, right? So the, the idea when you're market making is to make money every day, right? Even if it's a dollar or whatever, right? Or a $10,000 or whatever it's going to be, right? Your, your goal is to make money every day and not get caught off sides on, you know, Trump speech day or, you know, some XRP news day, you know, one of these like outlier days where you hear makers get blown out or people get blown out by holding too much risk or... And the Delta hedging isn't free, right? Um, you can keep paying money over, even though you're loosening up margin or lightening up, lessening your margin, you still have to pay for it, right? You still have fees if you're taking, if you're making a collect, but if, you, if you're forced to take over and over again, you're losing money on fees and you have to continuously Delta hedge. If you run out of money to Delta hedge on the perp side or you run out of margin, I mean, this is when you hear people blow up, right? So... You have to think about this too. Like feeding that fire, you got to keep feeding the margin collateral for it. Yeah, over it all day, all you know, twenty four hours a day, right? Especially in this market, it never ends, right? So that's when you hear like makers blow up. Usually, makers, if they're doing it right, they shouldn't be caught off sides ever. It's that they're always, well, maybe they do get caught off sides, right? The smartest people in the room usually blow up. We thought the smartest people last cycle were super, super smart. They actually were the stupidest people and they either all got sued or they all got blown up, right? We have 3AC who blew up. You had um, Barry Silver who, you know, was forced to shut down. Um, usually the smartest people in the room turn out to be the dumbest, especially in this space for some reason. It's funny you were bringing up a point with like the APIs and like the front end not working. I remember last cycle, I think it was FTX. I was trading on- yeah. The front end wasn't working, but on silicone terminal, you could do API was working. And that was like, okay, fuck, I need to learn how to code. And what do you think about this AI, right? Everybody now thinks that they can be a coder because of AI. I, I'm in the boat that it's dangerous. If you know the product that you're talking about or that you're asking questions about, it sometimes gives you just fucking wrong outright answers. I've asked it some basic questions about options and it just lies to me. And then I tell it that it lied to me and then it's like, oh, sorry. Yeah. And then it might have given the right answer, but I think it's super dangerous like that people are just trusting, you know, whatever ChatGPT or Grox or what Gronk or whatever the fuck it's called into putting into production code. Does anybody have yeah. any views on this? Mm. I personally, I, I use it a lot, but I think, yeah, to, to your point, like, I think, like, use it within, like, what you know, right? If you, if you can't confirm what it's spitting out, or you have no idea what it's spitting out, then, like, it doesn't really, I think, benef benefit, I think. Here's what, Mando, who has to say about this, I think. I mean, I definitely don't think it's dangerous. I think the main thing about it is, you know, it lowers the barrier to entry to having a higher degree of competency in, you know, in coding or whatever it is you're researching. You know, you're taking the cost of education 
down from having to visit a hospital, you know, a university, read books, attend lectures. You've taken the cost of education down to the cost of compute. And ultimately, you know, everything will reduce down to the cost of compute, such as making a video or film or whatever. You know, the cost of compute for diagnosing, for example, a, a breast cancer scan will cost you, you know, 0. 0.0001 of a cent versus a doctor. You know, it's going to cost you five hundred dollars. So, you know, I think it's I don't think it's dangerous. I think it's just natural progression of technology. Yeah, we're in the infancy of stages of AI, I think, right? Like, it still lies to me about simple shit about options. So if you're absolutely trusting it to put into production code, it's different. It's different if you ask it, can you fix the commas? Can you make sure it's not all capitalized? You know, some simple things. But if you're like, okay, I want to create a cross-exchange arbitrage bot with whatever, you know, low latency, lean code um, on these exchanges, print, I don't think that this is viable in the long run. I have seen some good ones print out like, uh, I need to connect to X exchange, uh, just just to connect, you know, just to get positions or whatever. I have seen it um, do this well, you know, but putting it into app, let's say market making code, production code, I think is dangerous on this level in terms of Dangerous that it's not going to terminate or murder us, right? Dangerous that you lose money because of some flaw or some production bug or some latency or or that it's just out, outright not right. Yeah, I don't know who's going to trust money and real money, you know, with code that they don't know and understand and have just copy and pasted. I mean, oh, half of the people, half, you'd be surprised. I mean, this space is filled of, of, uh, I don't want to say retards, but fill, filled with retards and people just blindly trust, <laughs> blindly trust whatever. It's okay to do some basic shit. Uh, I think Delthrion, Delthrion, uh, he just, we have a public chat. I don't know if you can see it. Um, he said to actually code, one needs critical problem solving and strong abstract simplification. Going from zero to AI code won't work. Yeah, from, from level zero to production code, of course, it's not going to work. But I think you're right on the barrier to entry and access to education. And sure, you can ask it something very, you know, simple about history or whatever. And you don't have to go find the encyclopedia or read, you know, the 10,000 pages of a book to find out, I don't know, something about King Tut or something, you know, something simple. Um, are there any others besides chat GPT? Am I totally wrong here? Are there others I should check out or put to the test? I've only tried the the chat GPT. Maybe it's people Sam Altman printing me. People talk about Claude, you know, Anthropic. Uh, I've tried it as well. I think it was good as chat GPT personally. I've never tried Claude. Claude. Um, you can, you, you yeah, can also do good. Llama 3.1, you know, Facebook open source one. Seems that people have been running that as well lately. Which seems to be quite well performing. That one's local, right? You can run that one all local, right? Um, yeah, it's local. Yeah, I'll have to try that. Grand, uh, Grand here in the chat says, "Don't say that." I thought Chat Chat GPT was the future. Uh, you I, can also you not can it was do, the future. You can also do like uh, I think it's like cursor.com. You know where you basically uh, you know you have your Chat GPT basically just fully aware of your entire local code base so you're not having to you know so it's just working with you there's loads of stuff like this but you know this is this is still early days i mean i don't another year two year ten years you know we're going we, we are going exponential we are on the you know it's always exponential you're always exponential on the exponential graph but we are we are at the we're at the singularity you know very very quickly yeah, uh, I the use VS cursor. Code one is good. The VS Code one is good. Like if you accidentally do a capital letter or something, it will tick you off. Like, oh, this is not right, you know, or this won't work. That, that, that I I agree with, but I'm not sure I want to run full production code. Um, and people run it, so please don't take ChatGPT and just blindly trust it. What are we going to say, little Fox? It's getting uh, close, Chris Marty. It's getting pretty it's good, good though. No, it's, oh, that's, it's getting good, but it's not great. It's good, good, not great. But you, you wouldn't good. run it in production, but like as your base, like I see people all the time now that will use it as like, you know, uh, 
a, a little more than what you're saying. Like, you know, it's not just using it to, to, you know, find capitals or missing punctuation, but uh, they'll use it to write, you know, like the first <laughs> run of code. And then you as the human go in and you make your adjustments or you run it a few more times and, you know, you're going to audit it yourself. You shouldn't just be running it and putting it straight into production. Yeah. You're going to lose money. But like, I think that it's totally in a place and within the next year we'll be in a place where, uh, you know, people are fully using it uh, to support them in, uh, writing code. Like, uh, I know that there are plenty of teams that uh, I'm trying to think of a better way to phrase it. Cause right now you should be using AI to help you write code. If you're, if you're not, I feel like you're, you're at a disadvantage. There's so many plugins, uh, with copilot and with, uh, I'm trying to think of a few of the other ones that are probably like the VS code plugins that they have. Like there's so much yeah. shit to like help you out that is tailored specifically for code, uh, that, you know, uh, I don't think that it's fair to say that, like, you can't trust AI to write code in its current form. I think it's just, I think the the view should be, like, just like any code, like, even a human, you know, like, you wouldn't want to take the first run and then, like, push it into production without having, uh, it doesn't have to be a formal, you know, baby. Just fucking crowd strike it, dude. Just fucking But, like, you at least want it. your peers you know, to audit it. You at least want an audit from like your close peers that you respect in the industry or, or in your sector to look over the code, just like you would if you wrote the code. So like, you know, I don't really see it any different than that. Like you, you're always going to want a human to read over and audit, you know, whatever you're, you're about to put into production if it's some type of financial tool. You know, you can also think about this from from an economic standpoint, because you can just say, you know, am I more economically productive with the internet? Yes. Am I more economically productive, you know, utilizing AI in my work? Yes. Therefore, I have to use it to be competitive in the marketplace. Therefore, you know, adoption and usage will just continue to explode. I agree there. I agree that it, it's only going up. I think you can see this and that the market is pricing it in, right? AMD, NVIDIA, arm you know everything's just ripping you know smci it's all just absolutely ripping i totally agree that tech is the future and access to education is way easier using the internet and the more people that have access to technology and the internet uh, are better off you know if that's in terms of phones computers i don't know fucking drawing tablets whatever it is i'm just in the camp right now that i'm not comfortable shipping 100 percent ai but maybe I'm just three. Yeah, I'm with you. It, it, I no, no, I'm with you. You, I don't think anyone should be shipping 100% AI written code. I think that's silly, stupid, and totally irresponsible. Uh, because, like, you wouldn't ship. It doesn't have 100% accuracy. It doesn't have an understanding of exactly what you, the architect, wants. And there needs to be an audit. What? no matter what is creating the code that is going to go out to the public or retail, there should be an audit, whether it's a human or a machine. Like, sure, so, more eyes uh, on, on more on, on all the code, for sure. Not just one eye, one set of eyes on everything. Yeah, so um, I'm like right in the middle. Like I believe that like you 100% should be using AI tooling to help you write better code right now. But I also am on your side, Marty, where I, do not think that you should be pushing uh, code that has been written by AI uh, to production without there being some type of human intervention. I think Grant said it pretty good here. He said, if everyone has access to these tools, what happens or what happened to the edge? I think that they're playing a different game. Uh, like if you go to Citadel, they're playing a fucking a balance sheet game, right? They're not in the speed game, right? It's a total, they have way more funds to throw at it. They have way more PhDs to throw at the fucking problem. They're fixing and solving different problems than you or I are trying to go build. You know, I'm not trying to compete with Citadel ever or XTX markets, the guys out of London or you know, any of the SIG or any of the likes of those guys. Um, I think, uh, what do you guys think? If everybody what, has access to the tools, what happens to the edge? 
well, the edge is the understanding, right? And and the speed of implementation. Um, I, I talked about this a little bit when like uh, when the chat GPTs and other like GPT to retail facing like GPT tooling started coming out. That uh, I think that prompt engineering will be a a field or will be a job in the future because everyone who's using AI tooling or any company that's using AI tooling is going to want someone that understands how to interact with those interfaces really well, knows how to get the results that they're looking for efficiently uh, and can do it better than anyone else. So there are people now that, you know, have taken the time to really understand and refine the way that they, they uh, you know, present prompts to these different interfaces to get the results they're looking for. And, when you see the inputs that they're giving them, it's insane. You know, it, it's an art in itself. With uh, depending on what you're you're trying to to create. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, sciences, right? All the sciences, right? They they found a bunch of shit now. What you were you brought up breast cancer earlier, but like, you know, they found a bunch of cures already, a bunch of shit, and yeah, it's pushing technology forward, but still don't, don't push AI. It's forward. like what uh, in, in the comments, Delthiran said it best, like. If you have a clear idea in your mind and you know the AI will understand the process enough to go from human language to actual programming language, language, then it feels like having an assistant. It helps cut down the actual you know work by like thirty percent, um, and and I think that is the best way to look at it. Like it's an assistant to help you out. You should still be checking your assistant's work. You would do that if you had a teammate and they gave you work, you would check it to make sure that it was compatible with everything you did. You wouldn't just slop it together and be like, "Yep, it works. I trust it." Like you would always check the work for compatibility. So I don't know why you would trust, you know, just because it came from a machine that you would trust it any better when that machine is giving you an answer based off of the data provided on the internet. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't know exactly what you want. It may get it right. It may have determined that the answer it's presenting to you is what you want, but there's no way for it to know without it giving you the response. And then you, you know, either refining the answer you're looking for, you know, the prompt you're giving to it to get a, a more refined response or accepting the response and saying, yeah, that's correct. Thank you. I think like to touch on like what you were guys saying, it's like the edge, like what Grant, Grant was saying, like the edge, what happens to the edge? I feel like, I think the like, comparison, I think it's like you can give someone an, a hammer and like they can all use it in many different ways. Like some guy's probably gonna hit it right on the on the head. If you're trying to take out a nail, some guy like might try to hit the head part or use like the back part to pull it out. Like how they pull it out is completely different as well, too. And I think that's where like the original skills that you had before using AI, that's where AI can really like magnify, I guess. Well, for sure. Like the sense. neural link people are gonna be way ahead of us. Right. If you can just download another fucking language versus somebody who actually has to spend years like perfecting it, you know, you're just ahead, right? Like that that's where we're headed, right? Um it's like a second brain, I guess, almost yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, like if you could just download Portuguese instead of actually trying to study and learn it for fucking five years, like it's so much of an advantage. Like we'll probably I mean we're just you know going off on a tangent here, but we'll probably have like fucking different sport classes. You're a cyborg, you know, like you're not a human, right? So you're competing differently, right? Um, in different sectors of, of sports. So what what yeah. happened to the edge? Talk, talking about competing differently, I definitely am competing differently to you guys because I am not competing on speed. I am not interested in being co-located. I decided against this as a direction because I just thought it was uh almost like forever driving down the margins to to near zero you know in a game which i didn't want to be a part of so i stepped away from trying to be fast and speed you know have speed and so that's just not important to me yeah that's different different games right like i don't want to compete against citadel they have too much fucking money and they're always going to be better than me right so we're in a different niche you know, doing different um, strategies that don't necessarily have a lot of competitors, and that's where our edge is, right? But the tree moves, right? The edge changes. Um, once there's, I don't know, let's say um, Athena, for example, 
once there's everybody doing the Athena trade, the margins don't become as good. The trade doesn't become as popular. You know, funding starts to come down because they're too much of the OI in the space. You saw this from the launch to now, right? They were promising 60% returns and now it's 10. You know, they're just doing a, essentially a basis trade right now, right? It's nothing uh, too, too spectacular that you couldn't do on your, on your own. But when funding is super, super high, it looks juice. But when there's the same people doing the same shit or somebody gets too big, you know, the, the edge goes away and the trade moves and you know, you're never just doing the same thing forever in, in the trading world, right? Either you're moving from basis, you're doing cross arb exchange, you're doing market making, you know, it it always evolves, I guess. Do you think those guys okay. like up top, like, do they have, like, I guess, to, if you were to measure edge, like, do they have more edge or is like the edge that they're fighting for is much like a sliver? Depends on depends on what what we're talking like in the FX market, you're talking like basis points of of options, right? Like options or let's say price moves like a couple basis points, right? So the option doesn't move like whole percents or the market doesn't move whole percents like we see in crypto, right? They're fighting for a way smaller pie of you know micro percent, but they're fucking throwing yards of capital at it, right? So it's a totally different game. They're like, oh, if I made 1% today, like that's not today on, on one trade, like this is amazing. Where like people in crypto is like, oh, I don't get out of bed for a hundred less than 100%, right? Is like the joke, right? So they're just playing a different game, like interest rate swaps or FX or, uh, you know, in crypto, we're, we're still slow. There's still different pricing on every single exchange still have hacks you still have outliers and when the institutions come i don't want to hear people complain you know when bitcoin becomes a low ball product i don't want to hear any complaints because everybody um asked for the institutions to come and now they're coming how is saying some big words right now uh how second say. quarter inflation readings have added to our confidence like that word confidence if inflation moving down quickly, if in, if we see inflation moving down quickly or is in line with our expectations, growth reasonably strong and labor market remains consistent with our current conditions, a rate cut could be on the table in September. Well, this, is why I, this is why I was okay. saying earlier, people were trying to tell me that that a rate that a rate spike earlier rates going up because people wouldn't be able to pay their loans you know companies would shut down you know they wouldn't take on more loans it would slow everything down it'd be rate increase a hike or a cut now people tell me rate cutting is bearish so i just think people don't have a clue people are retards don't forget uh cme i'll, I'll post it in the show notes but cme has if you do cme group um fed watch tool i guess you could start with googling there it has exactly what's going to happen um you don't need to guess you don't need to wait for the news to drop um so today was 99 percent that it's going to be a no change a one percent of an ease a zero percent chance of a hike in september we have a 95.5 percent chance oh it says a hundred percent chance of an ease in September, a hundred percent chance right now. So and these are experts too, like expert analysts that are coming up with these things too. Though. Yeah, uh, in ease in November, one hundred percent, and in December, a hundred percent of an ease. Like this I mean, is pretty forget, straightforward of what's coming out, guys. Let's not forget the all the experts were also saying, "Don't buy Bitcoin." You know, who is an expert? Why should I listen to an expert? Oh, in something like this, in terms of cuts and hikes, it's pretty well known about what's going to come, right? The Federal Reserve so we know never what's really come, changed. But, but what does it mean? Does it mean whipsaw up and down sideways, whipsaw up and down up, whipsaw up and down down, just down? Just up? No it one means knows. Darth Maul, Darth Maul, and same price 10 minutes later. Like we just <laughs> yeah, so, so, That's so, what so, it means. So, so nobody knows. 
So if nobody knows, you know, like uh, people always say to me, oh, this data, this data, this data. And I'm like, well, that's great. That's fantastic. But does it actually help you make a, a better decision? And when people talk about rates going up and down, you know, jobs report, how many people sold turkeys, you know, over Christmas or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't affect my my ability to make a decision on my, uh, you know, my portfolio in the future, ultimately, because I just don't know from it. I think you could look out. I think if you look right now today and you're like, okay, well, where's app prices not seen since yesterday, right? This kind of thing. Uh, it's a different story, right? Like we had a huge move, huge move from 64 to 70 in anticipation of Trump and, you know, Vols rose fucking insanely. And you had all this hype around an unknown factor of what Trump is going to say on stage. He essentially said nothing, right? He said everything that we already knew he was going to say. And it doesn't matter. It just that's why I said I disagree. People who are calling this of the Trump trade completely disagree. And as per Trump saying oh, nothing, Price didn't give a shit. It proved the thesis. There's no Trump trade. You got BlackRock buying five thousand Bitcoin, three thousand Bitcoin every day. You know, you got a Phoenix whale, T WAP accumulating. Forget Trump trade. This is fucking retail pledge. The Trump trade was hilarious, dude, because everybody on Twitter is like, reasons why the Trump trade is on. I like that. The dude, Trump everybody trade. with a bank balance of about 50 bucks is talking that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, even even the number one uh, coin margin trader on Bybit wrote a thread, and I'm like, this is bullshit. Like, it's not happening. You know, I think the next day we went minus four thousand dollars or whatever right i'm like it's so over you guys hyped up this event so much balls were 125 at the money for the seat for the next day contract and it would just like got so blown out of proportion and so much hype like that it did not make any sense and i think we're seeing that now right like Dude, there is uh, only one strategy in this game there is Fine. only one strategy in this game and it's do you have more bitcoin at the end of the day than if you just bought and hold. If you are not outperforming buy and hold, you are nothing. Oh, for sure. Yeah, but there's mm -hmm. also these bigger shops that have a mandate, right? So you said, I said like, that on our Yeah, like like BlackRock's buying Bitcoin. Yeah, sure. Whoever. Millennium Fund is buying two billion dollars of Bitcoin. Sure. They're also short two billion dollars of futures contract and they're doing basis and capturing 13%, but they're making 13% on two billion dollars you know not 50 bucks like crypto twitter right these guys are putting real money getting real generative income for their investors or for their fund and that's like a different game and it's a different edge than like you know the regular crypto twitter guy doesn't care about 10 or 13 percent like even though that's an amazing return they don't care yeah i was gonna say this earlier when we were kind of talking about it like <clears throat> they they don't care because of it's all relative to liquidity, right? Like with the amount of money that they have, they're able to get outsized returns because the liquidity allows them to, for, you know, the capital they have to trade, yeah. but for the bigger guys, the liquidity doesn't exist there. So the, the 5% move to them where, where they're banking fucking, you know, eight figs and versus the 5% move to the guy that's got 0.1 Bitcoin you know, like the 0.1 Bitcoin holder, he needs the 5,000% Solana shitters because he only has $1,000 to throw in it. And whereas, you know, like the fund needs the liquid markets because they need to be able to, to settle their fucking $10 billion in two days if they need to. Um, and, you know, yeah, Mantle, what I was saying the other day is, you know, every cycle they're, they're – I've always had like a new me, me and my core group. And like, you know, last cycle when the VCs came, it was like the, the goal of the cycle is to not let the VCs steal all your Bitcoin or steal all your ETH. You know, if you're not, if you're not making more ETH, you know, trading the shit coin that you traded last cycle or in the farm that you, you decided to, to LP in, like you're just losing to the VCs that have now entered. And this year it's the banks, right? Like it's like, don't let the bankers or don't let Wall Street steal your Bitcoin. And it's like every, you have to kind of, you know, take that meme and make it a reality. Like every trade that you go into, it's like, 
do you, is the RR there for you to leave with more Bitcoin or with more ETH than you had before you went in? Or are you just fucking throwing money into a fire pit because everybody else is and you think like, hey, maybe, uh, maybe other people will buy this too. It's funny. Look, it has a hat. Of course that's all they're doing. It has a knitted hat. Of course that's all they're doing. They are not performing, you know, uh, back-tested, you know, proven, you know, decisions here. They're, they're just aping into whatever everybody else is aping into and hoping that everybody can sell it higher to a greater fall later. It's a fucking loser's market. Oh, for sure. We're up 56% on Bitcoin on the year, right, from, let's say, 40 Six, and people's portfolios are at all-time lows you literally didn't have to do shit all you had to do was buy bitcoin people forgot that since ftx for two fucking years it's been up only from 16 to 60 grand 70k like you don't need outsized returns on shitters you don't need to put capital at risk most people are better off i, I guess the reason why people chase and why there is this is that they don't have a spot bag they haven't been accumulating. They haven't, you know, been either been here long enough or they lost it all, you know, trading perp. Well, that is the right. one thing. You're, you have a, you, you look at like where are a lot of people uh, getting exposure to, you know, in, in the beginning. And it's like, ones. well, yeah, but it's not, it's not, it's not solely his fault. Every cycle you have a low liquidity sector of the market that gives outsized returns. And that's what attracts the majority of retail because the newer retail participants do not have the capital to gamble with the big boys, right? Like they're not coming in and, and spending their only $5,000 they have on three and a half ETH or on 2.5 yeah. ETH, you know, they want to own one. They want to own 1%. Like they want a yeah. chance to make it. They want, you know, and like the only way, the only opportunity they see to do that is you have to make it big gambling on the slot machines. Exactly. They're trying to cheat the work in proof of work. They're trying to cheat to get the gains and it'll never work. I don't know if that's cheating though. I think that's part, I think it's just separate games that you're playing. It's like, you know, you walk into a casino and there's the high roller tables. There's look, the at the Eden, look at the Eden chat right now. I don't know if you can pull it up privately, but if you can pull it up. I can, I can. Screen. I will in one that is, This is crypto Twitter in an image right here. But you know, I, I made really the cool. analogy before when someone was asking me like, you know, why I wasn't like, you know, all over uh, all the Solana shitters because I, I was in the trenches for all the ETH, you know, Ponzi's when we were doing like all the stable coin stuff and fucking what was the one? Uh, uh, and just like the DeFi summer course. stuff. And I told him that, you know, like, I don't play those games anymore. Like, I'm at the high limit poker table. I'm in the high limit room. You guys are at the slot machines. And I'm fine watching you ball out, fucking smack the screen like an ape on coke. Like, that's oh, fine. Sure. It's, am it's amusing to me. But I yeah. don't have to do that anymore. But I remember when I felt like I did have to do that. And it <laughs> yeah, I remember when I just I wanted to get to a level where I didn't where I could sit in the other room and look and not feel like I needed to do that. So I just I just look at it as a part of the casino and there are games that some people want to play and there are other and those games are like gross to other people, right? Like uh uh like I'm not going to sit down at the fucking like slot machines. <laughs> like Oh <laughs> sure. <laughs> But I'll play like just about every table game, you know, like it's uh, it's just your flavor and like what you what you want to do. I think I want to bring like the point like Marty was talking about, like the institutions and the banks, like there's so many different ways to trade. Like there's it's not just, OK, buy spot and then and just hope for it goes. Yeah, totally. And hope it goes directionally up like there's. Like, yeah, you can hedge, you can, like Marty was saying, rates, you can, the bases, like, there's so many ways to trade. And I think, like, there's no one searching way that works for sure. Like, yeah, with these meme coins, like, like, majority, I think, lose money. But, like, yeah, the people that hit it do hit it. And I think they might have some edge to some extent. But it's, like, it's just, it's just very different games that, like, you were saying, like, there's different tables, like, different games that everyone can play. And 
kind of like find one that like you can resonate with or that you understand. And like with the institution things, I think Cozy was saying like, um, it's like the institutions, like if they wanted to buy spot right now, like they can't just like market in and like just get filled right now. Like they have to trade a range. Like if they try to market buy, they're going to pump price like 10%. Like it's well, that's why most so, of these guys so do different. like, like Coinbase prime, right? Like just fill me. Right. I just want to buy, I don't know, a thousand Bitcoin, go find me a seller. They're not putting this shit on screen. Right. Or else. They, they would move the market so much, right? There's no liquidity for all of these big guys to get in all day. And I think that's what we saw with the ETFs, right? Like all these inflows, well, there has to be a seller, right? They, they have to go out and buy it at a certain price, right? So they do get filled, but it's just not how the regular CT8 gets filled, right? They're not crossing this red, you know, they're not uh, marketing mm -hmm. in, they're not showing their size on screen to scare the market, right? It's all done um, through OTC. OTC and Coinbase Prime is usually the um, the desk of choice. Mm -hmm. I think it, like the you guys were talking about the Trump thing as well too. And like I want to like buy the rumors, sell the news. I think like when I first got into crypto, like I heard that that was like didn't really understand it. But then like over the years, I'm like okay, now I get it. It's like you want to be long before the event. Then, or we yeah, have long before the event on the event, you want to pretty much just get out. Yeah, that's ball yeah, trading, right? You want to buy before the event in anticipation of the event, before the buildup of vault, and then you want to sell right before the event. You don't want to hold through the event, you don't care about the event, you just care about you know the Trump hype. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the rumors were like, yo, Trump might do a Bitcoin speech at. Bitcoin conference, like that's when you should buy it. And then when he's actually doing the speech or he's coming walking up on the stage, dump it. Well, CT doesn't often know the difference between a consensus trade and a crowded trade. How does one decipher it between the two? <laughs> because there can be consensus that something will be good and there could be and and nobody trading it, right? Like uh you could think like ETH bottom, right? Or longing ETH against something like you could have a lot of data to say like, oh, this is uh, this is why this will happen. There could be consensus, but like nobody fucking likes ETH, so nobody's going to take the trade. Mm -hmm. The yeah, most hated, you know, the most the hated side thing, of the trade. Yeah, you have to be like early. the most hated That's things the often. Pump the hardest. So if we think about getting rid of this race for speed, we can say that when Bitcoin actually does these big moves, it's not very often. And so really what you want to do in the most ideal scenario is look for when these big moves happen, the precursors. So, I mean, in, in a most ideal world, you buy the minute before the big move kicks off. And, you know, and you sell obviously the top, but, but, you know, you really, you want to be, you know, most of the time having your capital locked up, it's just kind of flailing around, not doing much. You really want it to be earning yield elsewhere until these big moves come. And then you, and then, you know, you see them coming, you go for them. And then you're not playing these racing games, co-locating, you know, competing for milliseconds, you know, with, you know, memory allocations and, you know, recompiling to, you know, you know, you're not playing those games. You're just playing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There games. wouldn't be an option space without us here. Okay. Somebody has to be <laughs> on the other side of the trade. Okay. Yeah, so we need to like compete in this dollars. race. For, for other people to uh, to get in. But yeah, I mean, it's everybody's exactly. playing a different game and there's different edges to, not yeah. milk, but different edges to play, right? You could have fucking done ETH ICO and fucked off forever. We wouldn't be having this conversation, you know? Like, exactly. And, and, I don't, and I don't personally want to be competing against, you know, big banks, MIT math guys and ex NASA engineer. I don't want to be competing with them. I can't. So. I can't. Exactly. I can't. Yeah, I don't I want can't. to. What? <laughs> These guys spent oh, years. Like, they can do like like yeah. They spent like yeah, just can't. You just can't. Though. There, there was a fun. The this is Jim Simmons fun. They have a hundred PhDs. Like I don't want to compete with that. That's enough, dude. Once those guys come, I'm out. I'll go find some other, you know, some other trade to put on. And probably the average like PhD there is probably like three, four. Like every one of them has three, four of them. Like, 
how am I going to compete with that? Like I can't. Yeah. So if if we go back to the teachings of Jesse Livermore, you know, uh, and and even further back to the introduction of Japanese candlesticks, you know, if you read those texts, you know, they read very much like a, a Bitcoin, uh, you know, Bitcoin Twitter or a shitcoin Twitter. You know, they read the same. The market, the dynamics, the greed, the fear, the cycle is always the same. And so, if it is the same, what does it matter what what we trade? If it, you know, as long as we as long as we can identify what is momentum, what is buying ultimately, you know, good, profitable, risk reward scenarios, you know, what does it matter? Why, why should we watch one market when we can automatically watch, you know, 10,000? Some oh, people point, tend to right? agree with you. Some, some people don't or can't focus, right? There's so much noise in the market. There's so many shit coins to trade. It's like just focus on one thing and find one thing you're good at. Be a one trick pony and you'll probably make it. You know, focus on one fucking thing. Not just trade ball. Only just two trade things ball, you need it. to trade then up ball, down ball. That's it. Direction doesn't matter. More of an operational risk. Well, guys, I got a hard stop right now, but um, I appreciate you guys coming on. I love you guys. Thank you guys for coming on. Any, any final price predictions, gun to the head, end of year? Not financial cool. advice. <laughs> sure, not financial advice. advice, strictly financial advice. Between one hundred and fifty. Whoa! End of year. Little point. Yeah, and end, end, end of year. Mantle, how many chairs do you sit on? I don't sit on the chair. I have a standing up desk. I'm stood up. Ooh. He has one desk. You heard it here, one folks. Desk. No chair. One desk. One desk. I, have four, I, have four, I have four desks in each home. <laughs> <laughs> and a little quant price prediction end of year. Uh, I think we'll probably see like 90, 100 k at least. Like at least, yeah, six figures. I think. Fuck it, we'll do the that next week. Are here. The boys are bullish. The guys, boys are bullish. Thank you for joining. We'll see you guys next or two Wednesdays. We're gonna have Jake on, uh, Mr. Von Goleri, my meme maker. He's gonna be our Ooh, very nice. Very nice. Actually, he might come on Friday, actually, for Eden. Yeah. Whenever. Dude, have him on. I think so. All right. The good. door is open. The garden is I cozy. Appreciate you, pimps. Thank Love you very you much. Clark, Thank you. Fibber, it was a pleasure. We do these uh, every other Wednesday. Always welcome back. Um, for all our listeners, like I said, we'll be back in two Wednesdays. Join us on Friday. Uh, in the morning, we do a stream on Eden. It's at Eden Aesthetics. And we'll have uh, Van Gorelli on. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Don't get liquidated. Later, pimps. Thank you, guys.